Hey, so this is, uh, everybody has seen this pretty much now. The Chris Benoit Dark Side of the Ring two hour special is in the books. And these are my news and notes. I'm going to do it in, uh, going to do it in PowerPoint presentation fashion. That way I can better organize my thoughts because there's so much information that's going to go through this documentary. Um, I want to, again, it's because this is not a review. So I will not be going through the entire documentary. I just will be going through some of the parts I thought were important, you know, pulling out quotes and different things that I thought were interesting. So um, let's get it started. First things first, I want to talk about this is different from the autopsy, the last days of Chris Benoit's um, documentary. Um, the differences are on the screen. So if you look at the screen, you can see them. But um, basically, the, the biggest difference is that autopsy is a show for normies people who don't watch wrestling and dark side of the ring is for people who do watch wrestling. So, you know, there's a lot of insight. There's a lot of, uh, um, big names that were involved with the dark side of the ring segment. There are almost no big names or, um, involved in the autopsy segment. For instance, um, um, Sandra Toffoloni, who was the sister of Nancy Benoit. She was not involved in the autopsy episode. David Benoit was not involved in the autopsy episode. Neither was Jericho or Chavo or anybody like that. Um, the autopsy episode, episode was uh, very pointed. They were trying to figure out why Chris Benoit killed his family as opposed to telling the story uh, of Chris Benoit. They, they tossed in some theories that I'm going to talk about, you know, because a lot of these, because these documentaries are so close together they are, and they have some, a lot of overlap, we will be talking about when they overlap and when they separate. Um, the autopsy f uh, focused a lot on the scientific and the factual evidence with a uh, trained forensic um, therapist or forensic psych. No, it's forensic something or other. Let me look at my notes. It's a trained forensic something or other. And the dark side of the ring segment had, you know, had some um, some experts like Chris Nowitzki, Nowinski, and um, you know, the sheriff, but a lot of the information was delivered by, you know, a journalist named Michael, was it, Ma or Matthew Randazzo, I'm sorry. So Matthew Randazzo was um, the main, well, it talked a lot about the intricacies of the case as far as the evidence against Chris and all these sorts of things. So uh, that those are the two differences. Um, you can watch both of them and get, you know, some, to come to a, a similar uh, outcome. So, you know, and if if you really want to, want to torture yourself, you'll watch both of them. I, I tortured myself and watched both of these. Um, the Dark Side of the Ring is two hours, so of course they got a lot more done than in the autopsy episode, which was only one hour, which is technically only 45 minutes because of like 15 minutes of commercials. So let's get really into started into the Dark Side of the Ring segment. So the first thing I want to say is um, I want to make a couple of points. Um, David Benoit is, you know, he... I, uh, he's this uh, generation's Kevin Von Erich. For those of you who don't know, Kevin Von Erich is the sole surviving Von Erich from the Von Erich family. Um, his brothers mostly either died or committed suicide. Most of them committed suicide. Um, Kevin, Kerry Von Erich, the Texas Tornado, former Intercontinental Champion for the WWE, committed suicide. Um, several of his other brothers have committed suicide. His brother David Von Erich, stomach it ruptured in Japan. He died, and Kevin Von Erich, just listening to Kevin Von Erich talk, he is one of the saddest men walking the planet. It's just, and his entire life is his whole family dying. That's what his legacy is, is all the Von Erichs died. And that's the story of Kevin Von Erich. And now that's the story of David Benoit, is that he's known mostly for all, his entire family dying, with the exception of his sister and his grandparents. You know, but pretty much... His entire immediate family, his father, his stepmother, his little brother, little half brother, dead. All you know, and these are, uh, and you can, and you feel great sympathy for him, and in some cases even pity. And I want to start, if somebody wants to start the hashtag or whatever, but we need to stop David Benoit from having conversations about this. To me, this is the last time David Benoit ever needs to discuss this subject. Um, he does not need to talk about this ever again. It's, it's too damaging to his mental state. In the After Dark segment, which I didn't put in here, but I watched it, 
um, they talked about David Benoit and um, Chavo Guerrero talked a lot about how they use they get bullied online and how losers will send them text messages talking about you know the dogs are in inside enclosed pool area, and it's like this torment where his his life is not being allowed to go forward because he's the son of Chris Benoit. He looks just like Chris Benoit, so it's it's horrifying that he continues to live this and has lived this for 13 years. You know, it's time to let this guy move on with his life. And I know that he loves the wrestling business kind of in the same way that his dad did. And he wants to get into the wrestling business. It's probably not a good idea. It's almost really, 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 really a bad idea. But um, I just wanted to start this as far as my initial comments about this documentary is that I never, if I never hear David Benoit kind of have a conversation about this subject again, I would be happy. He never needs to talk about this again. It is, can't be good for his mental state. You know, the constant crying and breaking down because he, his people are calling his father a murderer. And, you know, this, this sort of stuff is very difficult. And you see that Chris Benoit's parents are not involved in this. You know, I'm not sure if they're still alive or not. But they were not involved in this. And uh, David Benoit has a sister who is also not involved. So it's entirely possible for your last name to be Benoit and not be involved with the Chris Benoit stuff. And David Benoit needs to put himself in that situation where he just does not answer any more questions about uh, Chris or the family. And I would be very happy if anybody who listens to this also agreed. You know, David Benoit never has discussed this subject again. Never. OK, um, so let's get into one of the interesting things that was in this um, documentary is they went over the, the career of Nancy Benoit, which is something that uh, the autopsy and usually most people leave out. Like a lot of people because Nancy was out of the business for most of Chris's career. Um, Nancy um, kind of just disappeared. Like, I don't remember what year a woman disappeared from WCW, but she just sort of vanished. And um, there was some talk of Nancy being uh, inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame because she's, you know, she was such a phenomenal um, valet. But I think you have the same problem that is if you induct Nancy as you would if you inducted Chris. It'll just bring up the Benoit stuff. And WWE, you know, <laughs> they don't want to do, to deal with the Benoit tragedy. They don't want to deal with the name Benoit. If they can uh, uh, disassociate from any sort of Benoit, that would be fine. But Nancy is cer certainly, to me, a Hall of Famer, and she's a great talent. So um, they talked a lot about uh, her Polynesian pro wrestling days when she teamed up with Kevin Sullivan, when she married Kevin Sullivan, who was her second husband. I didn't know she was she was married before Kevin. And uh, she left her first husband for Kevin, and then she left Kevin for Chris. So, uh, you know, she... That's that's kind of... That's the wrestling business, I guess. And um, I, I really thought it was interesting that... Um, she got um, the look for her character from a Uriah Heat album cover, which was, you know, told us to told to us by Sandra um, Tofaloni, who was her sister, um, which was really interesting. I thought the the Nancy Benoit stuff um, being added to the documentary, I think, really it 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 did a good job of fleshing out who Nancy is and what her um, part in the business was, and that she's not just Chris's victim. That, you know, she's only known because she was killed by Chris Benoit, you know, and that's that's a good thing. And usually I don't really care for the feminist trope of, you know, the woman needs to be fully fleshed out. But in this instance, it, it fits because Nancy had a storied career in the business, um, you know, as before, you know, this whole thing happened. Um, so they talked a lot about Chris, obviously. There were some interesting things that um, that were said. My favorite thing that was said about Chris Benoit is um, Jericho talked about the change in the Chris Benoit character when he went to WWE and how he became a sort of Dirty Harry type of character. And if you've ever seen the movie Dirty Harry, um, Dirty, Dirty Harry is sort of an anti-hero. He's a very uh, black and white guy. He challenges, you know, the, the villains and he's, you know, he's, he's kind of rough around the edges, but he's very tough very Western, kind of like a John Wayne uh, character. And I see that as far as Chris Benoit, I can see that, you know, that Benoit is like the tough guy, you know, and the, like the, 
you wouldn't you wouldn't call him a, a hero, but kind of like the sheriff. You know, he would come in and set things right. So that I think that kind of made Benoit a very likable guy because he his character always had high honor, even when he was a heel. You know, Benoit was always a very honorable guy, always willing to fight one on one, head up. You know, the crippler. You know, the tough guy. It's just it was amazing. Um, but on, on a per on a personal level, we heard a lot about Chris Benoit's perfection about how he had, he was a perfectionist. That um, Jericho talked about Benoit uh, selling a kick that didn't contact with him in Japan, that they had a match in Japan, and that Chris uh, Jericho threw a spin kick that Benoit sold without being touched. And then Benoit went and started doing Hindu squats because he was embarrassed that he, that he exposed the business in that way. And Jericho was like, you know, hey, what are you talking about? Like, nobody cares about this. Nobody saw it. It wasn't on TV. It's not that big of a deal. But it mattered to Chris because he was a perfectionist. And this sort of uh, fanatical obsession with being perfect and being right comes up again and again. And it's actually what I, um, they used to bridge his conversations with Eddie Guerrero. Because Eddie Guerrero was, was uh, I guess, some, somewhat similar. But they also, um, there was an interview but post-wrestling with uh, Jeff Merrick, who used to have conversations with Chris Benoit all the time. And he talked about Chris Benoit being a perfectionist as well. And that Benoit used to have you know, this unyielding um, frustration with promos. And that, you know, he never liked doing promos. Because he said, and the, the quote that Jeff Merrick said, that I should have put down because I've got to remember off the top of my head, is that Chris told him, that I can learn anything physically. If you teach me, you know, I can learn any move. I can't learn how to talk people into the building. It was just not something he, I was comfortable with. And Chris Benoit was always insecure and uncomfortable in his personality because he was so quiet. And that's another thing that, uh, that you hear a lot about Chris Benoit is that he, how quiet he was, how silent he was, how, um, you know, he was a hardworking guy and he did he didn't really want do want to do all the flash and all the media and stuff even though he enjoyed being you know a hero to children and stuff like that he was really an understated guy and it made him really uncomfortable to have to c carry a microphone and i think that says a lot because him not him being the guy who was i guess you could say shy being the the WWE champion even though he was the world heavyweight champion it was supposed to be equivalent championships. He was the top guy in the business. You know, he was the raw champion. So he was the top guy in the business at the time. And I wanted to, I wish we could have a conversation about how he might have felt about that. You know, they probably had a conversation about it in the Chris Benoit documentary, which I actually have the DVD of the Chris Benoit documentary. I haven't watched it uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons. But, um, Chris Benoit being a perfectionist and being very insecure in his personality are two things that I think that you can walk away with with understanding that what kind of person he was. That he was an intense performer, but he was definitely insecure about his um, personality and or lack thereof. And a lot of people nowadays, like I see on Twitter and stuff, people saying like he was a no personality uh, mechanic. And like, yeah, he was. That's That was Chris Benoit. And that's actually why a lot of people liked him because he was very good. He was probably one of the best at his actual job which wasn't to be like super flashy um but the third thing that that was important i think to walk away from is chris benoit made the decision and this was chris jericho's uh statement he said that chris benoit's first job and his last job was pro wrestling the only thing he ever took a paycheck from was pro wrestling and the author of the ring of hell book matthew randazzo he said that chris benoit decided that he was going to do whatever it took to be a professional wrestler at 14 years old. And, and so when you look at that sort of singular tunnel vision on being one thing, being the best wrestler and being you know a professional wrestler, you have to take into account this guy meant business. Like, so you have to take this into account when you're thinking about certain things that Benoit has done over the years, especially one of the two other things I think I'm about to bring up in a minute, it, you really have to really remember that Chris Benoit made this decision bef long before he was even in WCW, before he had wrestled in Japan, before he had done anything. You know, Benoit had made the decision to be a 
pro wrestler and he, you know, and there was even some talk that maybe he even started doing um, steroids um, in high school so that he could look bigger uh, in pro wrestling. So, you know, that's just some backstory on Chris Benoit. So a part of this thing was uh, Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero was a significant part of the of this story because obviously Eddie Guerrero was a significant part of Chris Benoit's life and therefore a significant part of the Chris Benoit narrative of um, of his downfall. Like Eddie is seen as sort of being the the party, the party, the outgoing Chris Benoit. Like, you know, they, they, they parallel in a lot of ways, except for Eddie was an extrovert. Chris is an introvert. So, you know... Ed, he can only you know, let his hair down and chill out around Eddie, you know, so Eddie made him safe. And this, this sort of thing is very interesting um, for obvious reasons that, you know, these two were really close friends. But some really touching things were said, um, specifically the, the, the David Benoit, who had a lot of good quotes in this, by the way. But he said that he wished that Eddie and Chris had retired after WrestleMania 20. And... You think about it and you say, well, shit, <laughs> I, I do too. You know, like if you, especially if you'd have known what, what happened to them, you know, for starters, neither one of them got back to the, to the, to the top. You know, Eddie never got back to being WWE champion, even though he was really close. And Chris was nowhere near close being the WWE champion again. And, um, you have to, you basically have to ask yourself, like these guys had reached the pinnacle of the business together best friends it was the cherry on top of their careers and you know it 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 they it wasn't going to get any better than that and that was a great quote from uh David Benoit and Chavo said that you know the the hug at WrestleMania 20 wasn't just a memorable wrestling moment but it was a a very important TV moment and i think that that's also very important i think that's also very true that is very rare that you, you see people who have been friends since the early 90s. These guys have been friends for over 10 years. By the time they had uh, main evented, well, you know, by the time Chris Benoit won the title and they main evented WrestleMania together, you know, hold, hugging in the middle of the ring, they had been friends for 10 years already. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, that's, really, that's really, really memorable. That's really, really important. And... You can you can tell they can only really go downhill from 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 there, you know. So they talked a lot about um, Eddie. They went through Eddie. They didn't go through Eddie's entire biography. They just went through when Eddie met Chris in Japan and how they didn't like each other, and uh, how they came to respect one another, and then they kind of became best friends with Eddie um, converting Chris to Christianity. So Chris Benoit was not apparently not very um, religious. And, uh, you know, he met Eddie, who was really religious, and Eddie kind of converted us. And I, I, I love that. Even though I'm not religious myself, I just, I love the idea that they were so close that Chris was able to sort of take in what Eddie was, was up to. And maybe even, you know, allowed himself to be open enough to have conversations and even consider, uh, um, joining him in, in the church and stuff like that. And I really, really thought this was a really needy portion of the story. Um, and <clears throat> Dean Malenko was also very important in this. And Dean Malenko was also in the documentary, of course. Um, but, you know, we didn't go through the, the, the life and times of Dean Malenko, <laughs> you know. But um, these, these are guys who, if you look at it, Eddie and Chris, they wrestled everywhere together. They wrestled in Japan together. They wrestled the ECW together. They wrestled in WCW together. They wrestled in WWE together. And he died a year apart. These guys were just glued to the hip, you know. And it's, it makes sense narratively for the story that they're telling in the documentary that, you know, um, Eddie was everything to Chris. And he was like, you know, he was his best friend. And... It, it, it's very meaningful. And I, I appreciate that they put um, the Eddie portion in the documentary because it's not enough to just say, oh yeah, well, Eddie, Eddie was his best friend and all that type of stuff. Just show me. And they did. They showed. They did a really good job. Um, so a lot of 
the media the media portion, of course, is the psychological damage of Eddie Guerrero's death on Chris Benoit. Um, so apparently, the after Eddie died, um, WWE was going on a vacation not not vacation a tour of Europe, and Chris Jericho um, was talked told this story that Chris Benoit actually went on that tour right after Eddie died, and he said that maybe Chris should have taken some time off, but that Chris didn't want to take time off. He wanted to go work. And this ties back into the previous spot when I told you that Chris Benoit was very dedicated to, to the business to the point where he was able to, he was willing to put to the side his own emotions and go to work, even though his best friend had just died, you know? And, but I, I, and this is just my opinion. He probably should have not only not gone to work, he should have also sought psychological help. You know, because it was apparent, again, apparent that Chris Benoit was not the same person after Eddie died that he was before. Um, Chavo Guerrero says something that a lot of people uh, um, picked up on, and I've seen this on Twitter already, and I've seen a lot of people say something about the stuff already, already <clears throat> that Chavo said that Eddie's death um, affected Chris like a spouse. Um, and the story that was told was that Chris just cried uncontrollably and in every, every building that they stepped into reminded Chris of Eddie and that, you know, it was incredibly damaging and some, and Vicky told the story of, uh, Chris laying in on Eddie's side of their bed that, you know, he would climb into Vicky and Eddie's bed and he would take at Chris's, uh, Chris would take Eddie's side of the bed and, and cry. And that does make a lot of people think that they're gay or whatever. And that's kind of the conspiracy theory. But, you know, again, no, no hard evidence of that. Um, and then after this, of course, we, we started hearing about Chris becoming paranoid. This is a, a story that comes up. Um, but also that um, uh, Chris Jericho said that this Eddie's death changed not only Chris Benoit's personality, but it changed his relationships with other people, that his uh, social circle got smaller, that it seemed like Eddie was so important that after Eddie died, he actually became less friendly with everyone, that he kind of closed up. And it was also very interesting that Nancy wanted Chris to retire around this time. And I forget who said it. I, I think it might have been Sandra. I, I don't want to lie, but somebody said that Chris was, you know, that Nancy wanted Chris to retire because of how the much how much stress and depression he was going through after Eddie died, and um, that probably would have been a better idea too. That he maybe he should have just walked away. But again, you're talking about somebody who was, you know, when Eddie died, Chris was 38. He still could have retired and done very well for himself. Yeah, he had done very well for himself. He had worked almost 20 years straight or some crazy stuff like that, you know, with the exception of, the, of that time he had a broken neck. But um, he, he just loved the business too much. He didn't want to leave. And, you know, maybe that was a bad thing that, um, that maybe that was a bad thing that happened. But Jericho said that, you know, Benoit essentially became a hermit when, uh, when Eddie died. Exactly. He just, he basically changed. You know, he just became a completely different person. So they they, they, they talked about the murders. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of the murders, but um, this is my first criticism of the documentary is that they had this writer, uh, Matthew Randazzo, uh, tell the story of the murders, which I think is probably should have been done by a detective or somebody um, who could use a little bit more uh, direct uh, expertise. Um, I'm, I don't, I don't want to challenge the writer and say that he's, you know, dog shit or anything like that. I don't know, but I just feel like a, 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 crime, a crime professional should have had, should have done this part. But apparently to the story goes that, um, WWE was doing a loop in Texas and, um, Chris had missed a couple of shows, one of them being a Beaumont show. And then he was also not going to show up to the pay-per-view that Sunday. And WWE was concerned about him. They called the welfare check. They played the welfare check. Um, and then, you know, they had a sheriff. The sheriff who did the welfare check was in the documentary. I didn't document his name because I didn't think it was important. The, the family friend who lived next door 
went, took the Benoit's dogs back into the house. And she was the first one to see Daniel dead in his bedroom. And then she spazzed out, told the police. The police, you know, went in and they found all three of them in different parts of the house. So then uh, the, the writer, Matthew Randazzo, goes through the, the story. And apparently the story goes that on Friday, uh, there was a barbecue at the Benoit residence that Nancy and Chris got into an argument. And then later that night, Chris uh, killed Nancy and then tied her up in uh, a blanket or in some type of a rug or something. Now, this is different from the autopsy, which says that... Uh, Autopsy TV show, which says that Nancy was bound and then strangled. And here it seems like he was he strangled Nancy and then wrapped her up uh, before putting a Bible next to the bedroom, uh, next to her body. Um, that's I, I, that's that's so bothersome. Then he killed Daniel the next day. He drugged Daniel and then smothered him in uh, a pillow or something to that effect. Smothered the baby in his bed. And then the next day, Chris killed himself. But, and of course, in between all this, Chris did the texting and the searching of the, uh, did the Bible search and all that sort of stuff. So basically, the story is becoming that Chris pre premeditated and brutally murdered his entire family over the course of a weekend. So, um, but before, you know, before we go, you know, into this part, I think there's, it needs it's some to be something to be said about him sleeping in the house with two dead bodies. There's something bizarre about that. Yes, and there were alcohol bottles, you know, in the house, and uh, people said it may have been some drinking or something like that. And I don't think that that's normal. You know, that's just me. I don't think there's anything normal with you killing your wife and then sleeping with, uh, you know, with her dead body in the house for two days. After a day or so, the body begins to decompose and it begins to smell. Okay, so uh, that's probably was really uncomfortable, and I don't think a, a regular normal person would do something like that. You know, I just I don't believe a normal person would just be in a house with a corpse all day, and then for two days, and then you know his son slept in the house with his mother dead in the house, like that's. That's fucking psychotic, right? Okay, so they talked about WWE. And uh, the WWE, they talked about the tribute show that they did in 2007. They showed clips of John Cena and Chavo Guerrero and Steve Austin and CM Punk. Everybody saying nice things about Chris Benoit. And, of course, JR was in the documentary and he was the resident WWE guy, even though he doesn't work there anymore. Um, but he basically said, like, hey, we did this thing without knowing all the information. You know, we didn't know... Chris Benoit had murdered his family. There are some conspiracy theories out there that say that, you know, WWE had to have known, which I, I heard is a Dave Meltzer thing that, you know, um, that, you know, somebody told them that, you know, uh, but it doesn't make, that, that wasn't, that wouldn't make sense for them to do a tribute show and then erase the tribute show immediately afterwards. That didn't make any sense. So the next night on ECW on Sci-Fi, Vince McMahon retracts his support and for Chris Benoit and promises to never mention the Chris Benoit name again, which to my knowledge, they kind of haven't unless, you know, it's, unless it's been uh, in passing, they really don't mention Chris Benoit at all. Um, the, they talked a lot about the media firestorm, which is a lot about test, uh, the WWE wellness program uh, and steroids. And WWE's response to, the, to, to all of this stuff, because this was national news. This was, you know, worldwide news. And um, CNN and everybody was going through the ringer, because this was, again, a year after Eddie Guerrero, and some other wrestlers have died as well, you know, around this time. And it was becoming a really big deal, and they thought it was road rage. I mean, roid rage, I'm sorry. And uh, Vincent Mann even did some, some interviews and stuff like that to discuss this situation and he said that you know there was too much deliberation into the Benoit murders for it to be uh roid rage that you know it was you know calculated and I guess this is how Vince feels about the subject I don't you know I don't doubt anybody has asked him about it in 13 years and you know maybe has his opinion changed you know he probably hasn't thought it about, thought about it that much but um 
I can see how he could feel that way because it is a lot of deliberation that goes into drugging Daniel and, you know, the, the, the placement of the Bibles, the, the checking to, to see whether you can make the flight to go to the show, you know, which he attempted to do. You know, again, he checked to see if he could make the flight to the, to the pay-per-view um, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but WWE wanted and to trying to defend themselves, they told the media, hey, wait for the toxicology reports. The toxicology reports came back that Chris Benoit was pumped full of steroids. So they did. So uh, the, the writer, Matthew Randazzo, basically said that Nancy Benoit uh, had said that the drug testing of the WWE was a joke. That was the that was the quote that I guess they had pulled from her text messages. And Chris Jericho actually says, you know. It wasn't a joke that after Eddie died, it became really stringent and it was you couldn't do weed and you couldn't do a bunch of other things, which is partial, which is, you know, there is some evidence that Chris Jericho isn't lying, you know, um, because Randy Orton had gotten popped for weed um, in 2006, which was I think it was no, it was it was right around the time that uh, of mania. 22. So it would have been earlier, maybe earlier that year, maybe 2007, earlier that year. But um, other people have also gotten busted for steroids around the same time. But um, there's also loose loopholes. And they didn't discuss this in the documentary, but there's also loopholes that maybe Chris had a, 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 a prescription and maybe that's what made it okay is that he had a prescription for, for, for these things. I mean, the guy had a metal stud in his neck, you know. Maybe they figured he, he needed that stuff. But um, the WWE um, sent Je- Jim Ross to Nancy and Daniel's funeral. Um, nobody went to Chris, Chris Benoit's funeral. Um, the family had a very private funeral that they didn't tell anybody when it happened or anything like that. And uh, like, likely nobody would have gone anyway. But JR said that he felt really unwanted um, at, the, at the Benoit funeral, the Nancy and Daniel Benoit funeral. Um, Sandra was really angry, um, at the WWE for some reason. I'm not sure why, um, she didn't really go into it. Um, and I don't think she was really even asked, well, she was asked whether, whether the WWE ever tried to support her and she said no. And, um, David said the same thing that David said that WWE acts like he doesn't exist, which, you know, is typical. Again, the name Benoit, they don't want anything to do with it. But um, Jim Ross was, you know, kind of run off, ran, ran out of the funeral, and he's talking about how uncomfortable it was, and I bet it was uncomfortable. I bet it was really bad, you know. Like you don't come on, let the guy. I don't know, man. Like it makes sense to be angry, you know, because the company is on TV, kind of defending their own ass at the same time, you know. They're trying to not hurt their own bottom line and stuff like that. So you you have this crazy uh duality you always do with the wwe because they do they, they have been playing this whole it's a business but it's a family at uh dynamic at the same time like you can't have both it's either a business or it's a family and the wwe has separated themselves from benoit almost completely by the time nancy and daniel were put in the ground so you had this idea that they were trying to pay their respects but nobody but jim ross came and uh I think that was fucked up. I think Vince should have went, you know. And I, I think Chavo and Chris Jericho went to the funeral as well. I'm not entirely sure. But, um, yeah, Vince should have went, for sure. Uh, so, again, Roy Rage was the, was the topic of discussion. They played all the media clips of uh, all, Fox and MSCNN. It was, it was a bipartisan effort to blame Roy Rage for what happened. Um, Jericho talked a lot about the Jericho and sort of the author um, were given opposing points of view where the author was saying, oh, well, it's a joke. And Chris Benoit passed all these drug tests to fight, despite the fact that he had elevated testosterone levels, um, which is which is true. But again, if, if there was some type of loophole that maybe, you know, he could have had a prescription and it would have been fine, that should have been discussed, but it wasn't discussed. And um, I, I'm, I'm trying to find out whether he had a prescription for uh, the steroids, 
and in the in the autopsy documentary it's it mentions the steroids and what it does to your body what about the mood swings and the mania um but it didn't say whether he, it was a prescription or not so i don't but it does say that you know long term abuse of steroids because he had a, a testicular atrophy so um most of everything on this slide we've already gone through that this man wanted uh, didn't believe that it was roid rage, that he believed that it was, you know, a lot of deliberation that went involved. And, um, you know, Chris Benoit had been using steroids since high school. And roid rage has just been the thing that the media always kind of like lacks on to. And, but the media was was just as, in some ways, wrong as WWE. When WWE did the tribute show, they didn't have all the information. When the media went through their whole roid rage, um fiasco they didn't i also didn't have all the information um when they got the information though they did find that chris benoit was had elevated levels of testosterone in his body but um that's when you know uh it didn't look good for the wwe at that point you know and so another part of the thing that they talked about was not talked about in the uh autopsy documentary it was something that i had really never heard didn't hear that much about because you know, um, it was it was always portrayed in a, in a lot of documentaries and a lot of stories as being sort of a storybook relationship between Nancy and Chris. But apparently, there was some domestic abuse situations that uh, maybe Chris had hit Nancy once um, in the years prior to the murders, and that she got a personal protection order. Which I I knew about that, but you can get a PPO. You don't need to actually have abused anybody to get a PPO. You can you can be you can get a PPO just because somebody scared you, you know. Like th that's that's they give those things out like candy. You know, <laughs> a PPO is nothing. But um, Sandra told the story of uh, Chris basically using her as an intermediary to get Nancy to take him back after he apparently hit her, and um, she said she wouldn't go into it um, any further because Benoit does have living children with a different woman. And um, I think that was really, I think that was nice. Even though you're calling the guy a murderer, it's, it seems kind of weird that you wouldn't uh, just go ahead and say that he was a wife beater too. Even though you are, you are saying he's a wife beater. But, you know, I don't know. Like, maybe it has something to do with Benoit's first wife. Who knows? You know, because she obviously didn't, has not said anything about this stuff and she wasn't involved in any of this stuff. So Chris Nowinski came comes in. He he was the star of the sh of the second part of the movie, as far as I'm concerned, because he came in and kind of laid everything down, as far as being a guy who knew what the hell he was talking about, and you know uh, he felt like it felt like finally an expert had stepped into the conversation. So for people who don't know, Chris Nowinski was a pro wrestler. He run he now he was a WWE wrestler at that. He was was he any good? Uh, he was wildly mediocre. Um, he was, he had a good gimmick though. Like he was legit, went to Harvard. So they kind of used that. And, um, he was, eh, he was all right. But now he runs the Concussion Legacy Foundation, which studies the brains of athletes past, um, after their death to look for CTE. He got six concussions in the WWE and retired. He, after his sixth one, he said, that's it. I'm done. You know, smart guy, right? The smartest guy in the room. He lived in the gimmick. He got the he got the six concessions. He's like, I'm out of here, bro. But he told the story of uh, meeting Chris Benoit, um, even though they worked on the, they worked at the same time. So, but he said he had a conversation with Chris about six months before the murders. So which would, it would have been December 2006, January 2007, and Chris Benoit approached him to discuss uh, what Chris Nowinski was doing. And Chris Nowinski was, of course, studying um, brain damage. Um, a study in concussions, rather, and its relationship correlation to brain damage. And he said that Chris Benoit was actually interested in talking to him about the kind of uh, damage that could be done to the brain through concussions. And, you know, Nowinski, then this is when he told Chris that he had six concussions, and that's why he's retiring. And then he asked Chris, how many concussions have you had? And Chris said, I had, I've had too many to count. But apparently they never really had got into 
a deep discussion on it, like uh, Chris Nowinski or Chris Benoit wanted to, and it kind of fizzled out. But after all the roid rage stuff had taken place to the news, Chris Nowinski said he it looked it did not look right to him that roid rage would cause this problem and that this would restart to look into the CTE um, and that he contacted Chris Benoit's father, Mike Benoit, who was not in the documentary, and um, asked if he could do uh, study Chris Benoit's brain, which of course he did, and they found all sorts of just all sorts of damage to Chris Benoit's brain. So, uh, so Chris, Chris Nowinski talks about like all, the only thing he knew prior to the Chris Benoit stuff is that CTE was almost purely looked at in football players. And he said there was four football players, you know, two of them had committed suicide and one had, uh, led the police on a, on a, on a, on a, a, a high speed chase and he crashed into like a barrier and died. So of the four football players that he knew with CTE, three of them were dead. And so he decided that there would got to be something about this uh, CTE thing and about this head damage that could be worth looking into. And he looked into it. Obviously, he found that Chris Benoit has severe CTE. And um, Chris Nowinski says, essentially, that uh, CTE can change your behaviors, your personalities, call mood swings, all, all that sort of stuff. And this is when it really gets interesting because now we start talking about the causes of the brain damage. Um, and Jericho was the star here because Jericho says like steel chair shots to the head was like a badge of honor. You know, essentially we all did it. You know, you would stand there, you would grit your teeth and you just let people wham, it would hit you across the head with this metal chair. And you never really know the damage that you know. Again, man, this the 80s and 90s was the wild west of wrestling. People were taking steroids. They were popping pills. They didn't care what that shit was doing to their body. They didn't care, man. Like, the fans was loving everything that they did. You know, they didn't really... There was no hipsters concerned trolling about their body and all that type of stuff. Like, you see people now concerned trolling about... They're not social distancing. They're not social distancing. They should be social distancing. Back then, man... <laughs> you know, Ultimate Warrior Hogan and Savage were in the, in the, were in the back... Snorting cocaine, hitting each other in the head with chairs. Like, it was, it was, it was insane, you know? Like, um, that was the business, you know? And Jericho was right. Like, it, it was, a, you, you would be considered a pussy if you wouldn't let nobody hit you in the head with a chair. I can see that. And that's kind of the, if you wanted to say that there's a quote-unquote toxic masculinity, that would be it. It would be the, uh, the, the masochism of the amount of self-harm that wrestlers will be willing to put themselves through to impress other people. And that's really what it is. You know, wrestlers willing to, you know, destroy their own bodies to impress other people, you know, to, to make fans happy, you know, goddamn Mick Foley lost teeth, you know, hit him, got hit in the head with chairs. So many, he got hit in the head with chairs like 15 times in one match. It's absolutely nonsensical that anybody would have to put themselves through that kind of damage. But, that was the business, you know, and I'm glad it's not the business anymore, you know, and I, I know that, you know, sometimes people think that wrestling has pussied out and sometimes you could pussy out for good reason. And you kind of don't want guys murdering their families or killing themselves because they have, um, you know, they got brain damage and now they're hearing voices and all sorts of other crazy stuff. Right. I think we can. That's a fair trade off. As far as I'm concerned. Besides, I don't really miss chair shots to the head that much anyway. So um, another interesting bit is that the families of the Tuffalonis, the, uh, which is Nancy's family, and the Benoit's, which is Chris's family, they hadn't had any conversation. That um, essentially the two groups had believed that each was mad at the other. Um, I don't know why Nancy's family... I know I can understand why Nancy's family would be mad at Chris. But I'm not sure why they would be mad at Chris's family. But anyway, they haven't talked for 13 years. They, uh, and David was, the way he talked about Nancy, is he talked about Nancy as if Nancy was his mom. And he said, we didn't use the word step in our family. You know, that when he was with Nancy, that was Nancy's son. And he considered Sandra to be his aunt. And they had not spoken in 13 years since the tragedy. And Chris Jericho um, brought the family together, and um, it was a really touching moment. 
I, I'm really glad that it happened because it seemed like it seemed like something both of them needed. You know, they both needed to heal over this, and maybe they can help one another. And um, sort of in the closing moments, we get that David, you know, who said, you know, hey, I've been bullied over this, and I'm always going to defend my dad. And his dad is still his hero because the man who killed his family is not the man that his, he knew. You know, like he knew his dad. He knew that his dad wouldn't do that. And um, he's going to defend him. And I say, David Benoit needs to stop having conversations about his dad. I said that earlier. He needs to stop it. You know, <laughs> like tomorrow, he needs to stop it. Um, but Sandra, of course, still pretty angry at Chris Benoit. She had a really great quote here. Well, she says that, you know, one day she wants to be able to forgive Chris. She says she can't do it now, but one day she wants to be able to forgive because carrying around so much hate is exhausting. And I think that that's a wonderful quote. And it's very, very true. And, um, you know, uh, somebody, I, if you ever seen the movie, uh, The Color Purple, uh, Celia in The Color Purple says that, you know, uh, uh, oh shit! The quote was in my head. It's uh, but I forgot. <laughs> it was a pretty good quote too about hate, but it was about it was basically like um, if you you know, some certain some people that you hate don't know it, other people don't care, right? So I think that was that's kind of the crux of it, is that you can hate whomever you want, but either a they don't know it, they don't know that you hate them, and b if they do know, they don't care. And then uh, there have been people in interviews who have said something like, you know, hate is taking poison and expecting the other person to die, you know. And I'm glad that Sandra is at, least, is at least willing to try to let it go, even though, you know, 13 years is a long time to be carrying that weight. You know, it's a really, really long time. And, you know, maybe some people will be like, I would hate her and hate Chris Benoit to the, to the day that I die. But, you know. Sometimes forgiveness is not for the other person. Sometimes it's for you. And we I, we end up having this conversation a lot, you know, um, in terms of uh, not to take this too far to the left, but in the black community, we had these conversations about police brutality and that the families usually are very quick to forgive. They usually forgive within a week. And people will say, oh, that's weakness. That was, you know, why are we always so forgiving? That's so weak. And then sometimes you have to realize that forgiveness and letting it go is not for the perpetrator. It's for your own mental well-being. And that's what it that's what you know Sandra is trying to get at here. That one day she's gonna stop poisoning herself with this hate for Chris Benoit. And one day she's gonna let it go. But she's just not ready to do that yet. And that's very interesting to me. And I and I hope she can get there sooner rather than later. So um, I did have, you know, some minor, uh, minor criticisms of the documentary. It was actually very good. It was a very good documentary. I'm glad that it ended on a positive note to let us know that the, the Benoit family, um, as far as Sandra and David and all of them, are moving on. Um, I, I'm really glad that, again, I've said earlier that I don't think Matthew Randazzo was the best guy to deliver the, the, the crime scene evidence and all that type of stuff. I think you should have gotten a police officer or a detective, maybe even the people who were at who who did the investigation. They should have been the ones to deliver that information. Um, I think having an author do it or a journalist do it um, kind of taints it a little bit because that person has, you know, this sort of personal bias because, you know, this guy wrote a book. He's going to just quote whatever his book says, you know, and somebody, you know, might have read that same evidence and got something different out of it because they're more of a professional in that field. But um, it was it was weird. But they also didn't mention any of the other drugs. And that's something that um, the autopsy documentary went into extensively is the amount of other drugs that Chris Benoit was do, doing, like like the Xanax and the um, and other, you know, other things that he was doing the painkillers and the, the Xanax and that sort of stuff, that stuff was important. You know, it was really important because all of this stuff affects Chris Benoit's mental state. And if you don't talk about all of these, this maelstrom of things that could affect his mental state, people can just say, well, it was just either steroids or it was CTE. Well, it could have been 
him, you know, drinking and taking painkillers and doing a bunch of other stuff. And who knows what the hell happened? You know, he basically just became a time bomb. Um, there was also no discussion of Chris Noir's career as far as uh, concern for his career. The autopsy documentary discussed, you know, basically brought up the theory that maybe Chris Benoit was unhappy with his spot in the WWE. And maybe because he was getting older, he was being moved to a sort of gatekeeper role. Now, this was not, they didn't have the language that I'm using. You know, autopsy was basically saying that, you know, maybe Chris Benoit was concerned about his career. Um, I'm saying that Chris Benoit was being put into a gatekeeper role because he was moved to the ECW brand. Um, Now, if anybody who can remember know that Kurt Angle was moved to the ECW brand in 2006. And then Kurt Angle quit the WWE because he was hopped up on painkillers and he quit the ECW brand. You know, basically it was a, you could see it as a demotion. You know, you're the top guy on the third brand. You're the ultimate gatekeeper. And this is what Chris Benoit was being relegated to is that he was taking the spot Kurt Angle quit over. You know, and... I think, and I don't know if Chris Benoit was the kind of guy who would be upset about something like that, but I think that that subject should have been looked at because the autopsy episode seemed to have um, some evidence that Chris was concerned about that. And maybe that was something that was, that came out of Nancy's text messages or the text messages that they have and that Chris maybe had some concern that um, he was being uh, pushed out and, um, Maybe that's why he didn't go do the show, you know, so who knows? But I think that that was something that we could have talked about and maybe some other. And, you know, he had those friends in the business, you know, Jericho and Chavo and all those guys. It would have been something to ask them, like, hey, did Chris ever have any problems being moved to the ECW brand? You know, did he did he complain about it? Did he have any issues with it? You know, he was going to be the ECW champion. That's why he was supposed to be at that show. But, you know, it didn't work out. And, you know, you kind of had to ask the question about whether that was a problem, that he was being relegated to the ECW brand, because he hadn't been moved to the brand. That, he, I think he had just been moved to that brand. He might have been moved to that brand like a week or two before, because I think, uh, let's see, June 2007, they had did the draft in like April or something like that, maybe May. You know, they, the draft wasn't that far off, you know, and I'm not sure if he wrestled on ECWS uh, on Sci-Fi yet, um, Chris Benoit, but I can I could basically ask the question of whether he was concerned about his career. So in my closing statements, um, the Chris Benoit tragedy is a maelstrom of brain damage, drug abuse, emotional trauma. You know, um, Nancy was always considered to be somebody who didn't take any shit, that she stood up for herself, and that that can sometimes lead to a lot of emotional volatility. And, the, and that's unfortunate. That sometimes, if you know, you're in the house with a bully, and, you know, somebody who's angry, and you stand up to them, either they back down or they double down, you know? So if, you know, Chris Benoit was a bully, you know, and abusive, and Nancy didn't back down, she was kind of feeding the fire, you know? And that's unfortunate. You know, a lot of people may say that's blaming the victim, but I'm just telling you the how real life works. That if you confront somebody, either they're going to back down or they're going to double down. So if you are in, the, uh, in a relationship with somebody and they're abusive, you either have to be ready to fight them back or you have to be ready to back down. And it sounds like Nancy was not the type of person to back down. And, you know, their arguments and stuff could re get really hot if that was the case. You know, it doesn't always have to turn into blows. It could just be people saying mean things to each other, you know, and who knows what the hell was being said in these conversations, you know. And you have an insecure, paranoid guy like Chris Benoit who had been doing uh, steroids since he was 14, who got severe brain damage. Who knows what the what the hell was going on in his brain? What the hell Nancy said out of her mouth that made him snap? Who knows? You know, who knows? Have, nobody has any idea. Ultimately, Chris Benoit is responsible for his own behavior. I'm just saying that sometimes when you're in these situations, it does not help to be confrontational when somebody's confronting you. Um, and 
that weekend in June, those three days in June, uh, really ruined the career of a really respectable pro wrestler. And you, you really couldn't find people to say anything negative about Chris Benoit before this. You know, if Benoit had slipped on a banana peel in his parking lot and broken his neck and died, people would not say some of the mean stuff that they say about him. Um, and, you know, it's kind of hard to defend, but, you know, sometimes people are just saying things just because it's easy to, to, to say. Now you're talking about hearing people say, like, oh, he wasn't that great a wrestler anyway. And you're like, oh, come on, man. Like, we, we, can, we can condemn the guy to hell without, without lying on him. Like, you don't need to lie on him. <laughs> you know, like, of all things, you're going to Like, the guy did the worst possible shit, you know, you could do. You don't have to start lying now. You know, like, we can start telling the truth. I think Jericho had a, a really good uh, spot at the end of the documentary, near the end of the documentary. When he said, when he said like, you know, it was on the, basically on the subject of whether Chris Benoit should go into the Hall of Fame. Everybody said no, essentially. But Jericho was talked about Chris Benoit's legacy. He said that, you know, critics are critics. But as long as you, this, this is a quote that he says that Chris Benoit told him personally, that Chris Benoit didn't care about what the critics thought. He just wanted his peers to respect him. And uh, he and he cared about the wrestling business. You know, he had been in love with it since he was 14. And now Chris Benoit, because of his actions at the end of his life, Chris Benoit lost 100% of the respect he ever had from his peers. No, none of his peers respect him anymore. And he almost killed the wrestling business. The two things that he really cared about outside of his family and in hell, including his family, he killed everything that he loved. You know, he, he loved his children, he killed them, loved his wife, killed her, almost killed the entire wrestling business, killed the respect that he had of his one of his best friends, who is his Dean Malenko, basically just says, you know, it's difficult to separate the man that I was in the car with with the uh with the guy who committed these horrible murders, you know, that you know it's unforgivable. And he's right, you know. There's no, there's no need for, for forgiving Chris Benoit, you know, um, to put that much thought into it. You kind of have to, you do have to let it go eventually. And that maybe forgiveness isn't the right word, but um, there is something interesting about that. And of course, the documentary pushed for WAB to sort of, it was, it became a, a sort of closet induct that Nancy into the Hall of Fame thing but the Benoit name is not gonna not gonna let that happen so I just remember something back in the uh in the subject of concussions um the reasoning for the concussions the the two main reasons that they talked about Benoit and concussions was the number one was the chair shots to the head which I talked about the second was the flying headbutt so um the this is where the the author I think shined because he was able to bring in his wrestling knowledge and he says that, you know, Harley Race uh, created the flying headbutt. He did it for all of these years. And he told people, don't use this move. It'll fuck up your neck and fuck up your spine. Don't do it. Um, despite that, the Dynamite Kid did it for up team number of years and ended up in a wheelchair. And he told, and, you know, he told Benoit, don't do it. Don't do the flying headbutt. Don't do it. Chris Benoit did the, the flying headbutt for over 20 fucking years and ended up murdering his family. And that was the, the author speaking. This is me speaking. Daniel Bryan does the flying headbutt and it ended his fucking career. And if you, there, for, for a short time, obviously. But the flying headbutt, remember when Daniel Bryan won the WWE Championship and he was wrestling Kane in a fucking bullshit extreme rules match and he did a flying headbutt off the top of like a crane or something i wish i could uh i wish i was a better youtuber so i can have like that the clip playing in the background of daniel bryan leaping off of that crane uh as the as the wwe world heavyweight champion this was right after he won the title and he continued to do the flying headbutt and this is a guy who ended up retiring from concussions and neck damage the flying headbutt is probably should be banned. Okay. <laughs> right along with power drivers 
it probably should be banned. And um, I'm pushing 100% for the flying headbutt to be banned. But I know that a lot of people were concerned also when it comes to the uh, the curb stomp. Um, also being a move that pe some people kind of want to ban because it's taking somebody's head and jamming it into the mat. Even though I think that Rollins is pretty safe with it. Who knows? Some asshole might come along and do an unsafe version of it. Um, but, you know, WWE doesn't really kind of put the X-Nay on a lot of power drivers because of Steve Austin. Um, they need to put the, the X-Nay on the flying head, but... And I'm, I'm not sure if I've seen Daniel Bryan do it recently, but uh, I know that he did it, and he used to do it. They used to call it the flying goat, and this is, that's not a good idea. They need to ban the flying head, but... So, um, but that was it. Um, thank you guys for listening to my presentation. Um, feel free to drop your comments down below. We can keep this discussion going. I really don't want to do any more Christmas watch videos. I really don't want to do any more Christmas watch videos. It's this stuff is exhausting. Okay, the Christmas watch story is the is one of the top three saddest stories in the professional wrestling business. Number one, no, well, probably due to the body count. Number one is probably Devon Eriks, and number two is the Benoit. I mean, it's just. You know, and maybe you could say Benoit is number one because it's so out of character for him. But, uh, well, they say it's out of character for him. I don't know him personally. But um, those two, because of the amount of death involved and the circumstances surrounding all of these deaths, the pro wrestling business does not need any more Chris Benoit's or any more Von Erichs or any more Bruiser Brodies or any more Owen Hart's, you know, Guys dying in the rain, guys dying outside the rain, you know, it's, it's not doing the business of any favors. Um, but this stuff is exhausting to talk about. It's exhausting to get through, you know, because you see the, the, the downward slope of somebody that you really like. And I still get those weird feelings of I'm not offended, too offended, or too upset to watch a Chris Benoit match. I watch a Chris Benoit match. I just have a difficult time looking at this situation and saying that uh, separating the art from the artist. You know, like I can watch a Benoit match and still just be like, damn, I can't believe this guy. I just can't believe this guy did this. And it's tough, and that's something that we got to we gotta learn how to deal with. And some fans who, who would say, well, just don't watch it. I think that that probably would be the best course of action if you feel that way. I'm not ever going to complain when people say that uh, they can't watch a Chris Benoit match. I will not complain. You know, you have, you probably shouldn't watch Chris Benoit matches because there's probably going to be a bunch of shit in there that you're going to look at and say, could that have been it? Could that have been it? Could that have been it? Could this flying head butt have been the, been the one that did it? Could it be this time he got hit in the head with a chill chair? How about I was just watching, um, I was considering watching. No, I was watching. I was watching the Backlash 2006 pay-per-view. And in that, on that event, Chris Benoit wrestled Edge. And Edge hit Benoit in the head with a brick. In the back of the head with a brick. And I'm pretty sure he didn't hit him super fucking hard. You know, but it was a real brick. Because uh, later, I think they, I think it was a last man standing match or something like that. And um, Edge threw the brick against the metal steps to get the clang sound. To show people that it was a real brick that he hit him with. Um, and I don't know if he hit him. He probably, he, look, Edge is a professional. He probably didn't, you know, take Benoit's fucking head off with the brick. He probably protected him a little bit. But, you know, that sort of stuff is... That stuff makes you cringe, you know? Like, when, <laughs> going to, to go back to Daniel Bryan a little bit, with the Daniel Bryan-Drew Gulak match, when, uh, I was just watching that match too, when uh, Daniel Bryan gets launched in this German suplex and he lands awkwardly on his neck, you cringe. Like, the, the Chris Benoit matches, they don't upset me because Chris Benoit murdered his family, which, you know, that's uh, that's upsetting enough. But you also have that that... That persistent, could this have been the time? 
good is that a concussion? Is that a concussion? Is that what caused the problem? And that would really what kind of makes me like, no, nah, I can't I can't sit through it. Like not only can I not sit through it because the guy killed his family. But now if I do manage to sit through it, I have to look at every time the guy took a a, a bump. You know, every time he jumps off something, every time he gets hit in the head with something, you gotta think like, well, was that the time? You know, did that cause some of that tau protein in his brain? Did that fuck him up? You know? And I, I that's that's stressful, man. That's exhausting. And I don't wanna I don't wanna have to go through that. So uh, whether you like Chris Benoit or not, man, um I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I put a lot of effort into it. I appreciate everybody who, you know, my, my other video had been seen like 2,000 times up to this point. So I appreciate everybody who's watching it, sharing it, talking about it. And I um, hope you guys like this one too. hope you guys like the documentary. I'm going to post the post-wrestling Jeff Merrick um, interview. I, I'm not going to do a review of that, but I will post it in the, in the, uh, in the low bar in the description. And if you're interested, you could, you know, click that and listen to that. It's an hour of Jeff Merrick, who was a Canadian um, hockey analyst who knew Chris Benoit personally, um, talking about Chris Benoit if you want, you know. Um, Ultimately, I I can't say that I'm a fan of Chris Benoit anymore, you know, just too much. But I've, I've stopped trying to figure out what happened, you know. It's just what happened was a tragedy. And, um... I wish it hadn't happened. Anyway, like, share, and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later.